It's had significant positive effects, according to a memo by United's CEO, Scott Kirby. For instance, since the vaccine mandate went into effect, the hospitalization rate among United employees has been 100 times lower than the general US population, helping the company go eight straight weeks with zero COVID-related deaths amongst its vaccinated employees. It shows a huge difference compared to employee data before the mandate, which showed that more than one United employee died from COVID every week on average. We are delighted now to have United Airlines Chief Digital Officer and Executive Vice President of Technology, Linda Jojo, who's gonna join us for a conversation about the future of transportation. In her role at United, Linda's responsible for information technology, data analytics, digital products, e-commerce, cybersecurity, and the airline's digital strategy. Her unique insights have been shaped by her forward-focused leadership style, which has been acknowledged by multiple organizations and culminated in Linda winning a Webby Award for the redesign of United's mobile app. She was named one of the top 50 most powerful women in technology by National Diversity Council and Crane's Chicago Business Tech 50 three different times. Prior to joining United in 2014, she was President and Chief Information Officer for Rogers Communications, which is Canada's leading wireless cable and media company. She's also served as the Chief Information Officer for Energy Future Holdings and also for FlowServe. For this session, I'm going to ask Linda a series of questions as we've done on the other two sessions, and then we'll use Slido to take your questions. On Slido, again, just enter Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. Event code is Innovate3, the number three. And you can either enter in your own question or you can upvote an existing one. And I'll attempt to, uh, to pose the most popular uh, questions. So Linda, first of all, a big welcome. It's great to, uh, to have you with us. Terry, uh, it's great to join you all, although I have to say, I would much rather have been there in person than here in my office where I've been for the last two years. Yes, you know, and I have to say <laughs> of our three speakers that we had, when I had to uh, tell them, you know, we have to go remote because of the school policy, <laughs> I dreaded talking to you the most because you've had such a great mindset about get out there, be there, and obviously working for United Airlines. So the next time we have you, I promise you it will be in person. And All right. uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for your flexibility. Um, Linda, let me just start out um, right on COVID and new normals. You've had to go through a radical set of changes in the industry and at United. Tell us about the changes and tell us about the role of technology in enabling the changes you had to make. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, not to dwell on, um, you know, kind of going back in time on this thing, we want to look forward, but I think it is important to think about how the airlines were in, you know, January or February of 2020, which was growing, uh, you know, everybody was, we were adding locations, adding uh, destinations, not just United, but the whole industry. And it was nearly overnight that the world shut down. And so, it, the stat I like to tell about United is that on average, a, a day like today on January 28th, the Friday, uh, we would have flown 450,000 passengers on that day. Well, there was a day in April of 2020 that we flew less passengers than we have pilots. Wow. So there is nothing that tells you more about the importance of the customer when suddenly they aren't there. I mean, it's just profound being in an airport where there isn't anybody else there. And so, you know, that caused a couple of things. In the short term, we were in life-saving preservation mode. We had served cash. Um, you know, customers not only were not buying tickets, they were asking for refunds. We literally had a run on the bank and we had to kind of go through that period of time. So that was a I'll call it a six week period of time. I wouldn't wish on anyone. And while we learned a lot, I never want to do that again. Um, but quickly, you have to think about how you can turn the crisis into an opportunity. And I think we did that across the board at United, not just in the technology organization, but I'll, I'll speak about technology, obviously, uh, primarily here. And, you know, the, the dynamic of 450,000 passengers flying every day with an airplane in the air all the time 
means that making technology change uh, has its risks because we all know um, if something does go wrong, um, it does affect our passengers. And you know, honestly, pretty soon they're tweeting about it. So it becomes pretty public when you have that kind of an issue. But when you don't have passengers, you can actually start to take more risk. And so um, there's a couple of things that we did during that period of time. First, we realized that the customers that we did have really had to fly where they needed to go. They, this was not leisure travel that we had going on in, uh, in April of 2020. And, so, and, they, and we needed to keep them safe. And we were still learning a lot about the virus. So we spun up teams that were really all about um, how we could do as much touchless as we could. And so how do we build things more into the United app? How do we think about the airport experience and make that um, a touchless experience? How do we keep technology or how do we use technology to make it safe for our employees? So that turned into things like a touchless kiosk that we had never envisioned. Um, even the time clocks and the things that our ramp agents would use going through the airport, um, we said, gee, they all have iPads. Why don't we all use geolocation? We know when they come to work. We know when they leave. How about we do that? And we built up, uh, we innovated very fast and tried things all to make it safer for our customers and employees. Excellent. And how is that continuing forward? Now, obviously, we're a couple of years into the pandemic. Yeah and you're thinking about the role of technology, how is it playing out uh, now? Yeah, well, uh, what we wanna make sure is that United comes out of this pandemic different than when we went in, better than when we went in. And so um, as we have really doubled down on the customer experience about what does it mean for a customer to choose United, um, all while making sure that we take care of our shareholders and make sure that we do return to profitability. We're, we're not profitable yet, and we have a lot of debt. Um, we have found that technology has a beautiful place between customer NPS and efficiencies. And so we are looking at the kinds of things that we can do that can improve the experience and help the, the company be more efficient. One example we have uh, that was not part of our of our game plan before the pandemic is something we call agent on demand. And that's an example of where, you know, if there's some kind of travel disruption and you're at the airport, typically you'd have to go get in line somewhere and talk to an agent and those lines would get long. And so uh, what we do now is we use a QR code. You can snap from your phone when you're you know, walking by an airport gate, or you can do it right from the mobile app. Um, we'll connect you with a live agent and that, and like a FaceTime, uh, conversation. And that live agent might be a few gates down in the same airport you're in, or maybe if we're, you know, have some type of like right now, big snowstorm uh, about to hit Newark, and we got a lot of stuff going on in Newark, and I'm not in LA, but I'm guessing the sun's out. Yep. Uh, we might help uh, our customers that are in Newark with a gate agent from LA. That's okay. efficiency that and by the way, that customers love that because they're yep. getting to talk to somebody more quickly. And let me ask you, you know, Linda, on the United mobile app, I'm a regular flyer of United as well as other airlines, but I'm very impressed with the United mobile app. And I kind of measure it by the number of uh, tasks and information I can get and how much time it takes for me to figure the thing out. And I'm always kind of thinking about, do I just call the United premier line or do I use the mobile app? And the percent of, of transactions and capability on the mobile app seems pretty good. Can you tell us, I know you guys won an award on it, but how did you get there? What, what allowed you to, to, uh, to do that? Yeah, well, we've had a mobile app um, for many years. Um, and so we've had a platform to do that. Um, but it was really the mobile app was always thought about as something for day of travel, check in, get through the airport, uh, use it at the gate and, and get on the plane. And mobile uh, united.com was thought about as that place you would go to buy a ticket. And that's how we thought of things, you know, 12 years ago or so. You did one, the app was one thing. We have merged all that technology now. So all the things you can do on .com, you can do on the app. So that, that's the first thing, both the purchase side um, and the day of travel side. And sometimes those are blurry, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to get rebooked or something. Uh, the, the second thing we did was uh, really we think about how do we give our customers more control, especially when there is some type of a, you know, 
un, something, the regular operations is what we call it, which frankly, there's always something going wrong, whether it's one plane or one light crew or one big blizzard, um, you know, there's always something that happens. So we thought about transparency and how do we give information to our customers um, so, that, so they can help make your own decisions about what you want to do. And we tried to get all the airline gobbledygook out of the out of the flow. So we used to say your plane is delayed for operational difficulties, or we'd say your plane is delayed due to the weather and you look out the window and see the sun shining and wonder what that's all about. Well, maybe it was weather and the plane coming through. So we just simply expanded the way we explained what was going on and put it in English. Mm -hmm. By the way, we drive that with a little bit of machine learning and artificial intelligence. There isn't actually a person there typing that, of course. And so we know the scenarios that we can, that we can put that up there. Um, and then the other thing we thought about is if you're starting on a digital channel, you don't want to talk, you know, you need to finish the transaction on the digital channel. We don't want you to get so far and then have to call somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to call somebody, there's still someone there and there's, you know, certain demographics that, that we really will probably always have the ability to do so. But we really just continue to look and say, what are the things that customers want to do? Can they do it in the app? And or they can only get so far in the app and then we would expand it. A good example of that is one thing customers have um, built up because of the pandemic is travel credits. Uh, you, you know, your flight got canceled or your plans changed and suddenly you've got all these travel credits. It used to be kind of hard to find out where those all were. We now have them right in the booking path. So right when you're about to purchase a ticket, you can give us new money with your credit card or you can um, you know, burn off your travel credits. And so just giving people that visibility, giving them that control, not having to call and ask, how much do I have? Can I apply it? If you can apply it, we, we actually will default and put it in there for you. Yeah. You know, one of the features you're talking about transparency of data and just share it with customers on the United mobile app, you're able to say, where is the aircraft coming from? Right. And I'm a little bit of like a data control freak. So the airline may say the flight's on time, but I want to know where it's coming from and how tight it is. And I'll go two and three levels back. Most of the other airlines don't do that. So there's yeah cloud over whether it's really on time or not. It's a, it's a great feature, but you have to have the philosophy, I think, from your point, that you want to be transparent with that data with your passengers. That's right. Don't go too far back, though, Terry, because sometimes we'll swap, we'll move the planes around. If we see one coming in that's really going to be late, we'll jigger things around, and especially in a hub, uh, before we move on. So don't get, you know... Good advice. I'll limit it to one or two. Uh, yeah, back you can see as far back as you want, but okay. Yeah. Excellent. Let me ask you on that topic about the use of data and the use of data on one side for customer purposes and the other one for operational purposes. So a couple of examples here. We had the CEO of Turkish Airlines a few weeks ago talk about personalized air travel, and he didn't have the time to get into a lot of the detail about using data to understand what the passenger wants. So I'd love to get your thought on that. And then separately, I used to do a case on GE that makes aircraft engines. And they talked all about IoT, you know, connected aircraft engines and looking at where aircraft fly and being able to predict when maintenance is needed as opposed to just having a standard. Tell us about the operational aspects of data as well. Sure. Um, so let's talk about personalization. Um, you know, the, uh, an example I'll, I'll give you for that is what we're doing with our flight attendants. So um, one of the first things we did was make sure that all of our employees have a mobile device. Um, they don't have desks. And so, so to expect them to, to go to some type of PC-based system to do their job was, is a little out of touch. So they all have um, devices where they, they do various parts of their job. For a flight attendant, um, when they, they look at their device, they can actually see, it's a seat map, a lot like if you're booking a ticket, but that seat map now has details about every single customer and different kinds of iconog iconograph, iconography, well, pictures um, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, talk about what their status is, um, whether if there's a, if they have a connection, there's a little airplane that shows up. If the connection is tight, the airplane turns red. So uh, we know who on the plane is maybe going to be stressed out about, um, you know, getting off the plane quickly. And then they can click in and they can see how their last five flights were. And so like, how, what's, how are they feeling about United right now? Did we lose your bag? Has everything gone perfectly? Um, you know, how are they, how are they feeling? And then, and then with all of this information, 
we let our flight attendants do what they do best, and that is take care of our customers. So we don't tell the flight attendant what to do with this data. We just provide it to them to be able to make that happen. And that's how the, our flight attendants use personal, personal data. There's lots of personalization in the mobile app as well. Um, not pricing, pricing is not, doesn't change by people, but um, what we serve up and how we show that. Um, I think on the, on the operational side and on the, the you know, big data and analytics, um, you know, airlines are blessed with a lot of data. And so the trick is how do you find out what that most important uh, information is? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, this data isn't always pristine and pure. While GE has um, engine data, it only, comes off, it only comes off the newest engines, not all the engines we have, and certainly not the engines made by other manufacturers. So it's always like, there's always layers of complexity with this data that you have to, you have to bring down together. But um, the other piece of it is um, we had a lot of data that was on all this paperwork that the maintenance guys used to, people used to fill out. And so one of the first things we did was digitize that and we used optical character recognition and started getting a base of what was actually happening to this aircraft. And now we are using that data for uh, predictive pieces, you know, on it. Sometimes it's the engine, um, but Sometimes it's just a simple thing like the unit that keeps the air cool on the plane while it's at the gate. If that doesn't work, the plane doesn't go either. And it's a much cheaper piece of equipment. It's a lot easier to change out. So being able to predict that, it's called an APU, facility power unit, to be able to predict failures in that has high impact and is a lot easier to do than the complexities of an aircraft engine. So we're actually going after some of that mm-hmm. first so that we can learn about how to handle uh, the more complex uh, information. Yeah, and in both of these cases, these are predictive applications. It reminds me when I worked at Vodafone, I think you worked at Rogers, we'd look at who experienced dropped and blocked calls and get a sense of, are they really unhappy with us? And are they likely to churn as a result? It's right. similar how you described it in the airline. If somebody's had a series of canceled flights for whatever reason, there's a, they're more likely to take a hostile position about the airline and you're going to take other actions. Is it fair to say that's that's the that's right. application? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We also use it when people send us email. Um, usually when it, by the time someone's sending us an email, they haven't had a, a great experience and they provide a whole bunch of information about this flight was this many minutes or hours late and then this happened and then this happened Um, for our agents that are actually doing the research on that we actually can parse that email we do two things one we gather all the data from our other systems about the the flight from LA to Chicago on Friday the 28th this was the operating characteristics of it Um, these are the other things about that day or about the email and then we do sentiment analysis about you know, what it, what, what's the sentiment of the customer based on the word choices they use to help the, the agent get started on how to respond to this. Again, we let the human being, the agent, the professional do the final touches, but we get them started on, yeah. how, on how to work that. Let me ask you now the even more advanced futuristic uh, use yeah. of data. Um, and, you know, we talk about autonomous vehicles a lot. Let me ask you about autonomous aircraft. Um, there was just, I don't know if you posted on LinkedIn or somebody about an academy that United is sponsoring now because there's been such a shortage of pilots. Right. Um, is the kind of strategic argument is, number one, technology is available, data is available. We've got a shortage of pilots. We need to be advancing the idea of autonomous aircraft. What is your broad view? Is that kind of not in our lifetime or no, 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 this is, this is coming? Well, everything about technology happens faster than we think. And so, you know, I I don't want to predict a timeline on that. So I think, um, you know, just like we're learning autonomous cars have, there's a lot of other things. And it's not just the technology of how to make the car go, but some of the choices that have to get made in real time and how to make some of those choices, those same problems occur, um, you know, in the cockpit. And you know, I don't even know if we're ready to go to a single pilot. That would be the first step would be a single pilot. And I don't think we're ready as an industry or as a culture um, for that to happen, uh, to have only one person that would be there. So, you know, there's a lot of things we already do to help, uh, you know, give best decisions to the, to the, um, 
to the pilots, but I don't think that's the first thing that would happen. I think that the technology innovation and the invasion of the future is more around how these, these aircraft are going to be powered. Um, and, you know, uh, airlines are, you know, one of the highest emitters of carbon um, with all of the fuel that we burn. And, uh, you know, United has said that we are going to be carbon neutral by 2050. And we've got to do that um, with the sustainable. One of the main ways is more efficient engines. So newer engines and newer airplanes, um, but also what are the fuels that we burn, what kind of sustainable aviation fuel we burn. Um, and so we do, we're doing a lot of work to actually um, help that industry get going and put the backing behind. We formed a, a, a company, uh, United Airlines Ventures, to help um, seed fund um, some of these things, some of this technology, you know, what the different kind of feedstocks can be used, the different kind of technology to turn that into fuel um, so that we can just increase the amount of fuel that's going to be available to burn. But the other things, and these are a little further out, but again, if we don't put a little bit of backing behind this, um, it'll never get started. And we have to get these things started. And, and that's uh, battery technology and hydrogen fuel. They both have a lot of problems uh, right now. The batteries are heavy. You need a lot of thrust to get those big planes off the ground and you need a lot of stored energy. And so, um, you know, one of the things you have to realize is you have to carry the weight of your fuel repulsion system with the plane. So it makes it heavier. Mm -hmm. um, hydrogen, um, it's really around safety and how do you actually get the hydrogen fuel to the airplane safely through pipelines and whatever. And then how do you make sure that you can carry it safely um, in the aircraft? Um, but we are invested in companies and startups that are actually doing that work. Um, you know, our engineers are working with them to try and understand what the operating conditions are just to try and uh, move this along. And that's where I think that's going to be the innovation you're going to see out of airlines before you see changes in how the planes fly, the ones with people in it anyway. Yeah, and on the longer term one, um, just trying to think of analogies on autonomous aircraft, is there an analogy to autonomous vehicles that now more and more they're finding that urban environments are very difficult today right. to make work. Um, and urban environments where the rules of the road are not clear is especially problematic. Long haul trucking, however, much easier. Is it analogous in, in air travel that maybe flights between certain locations that are less dense are, are gonna be an area where you might see uh, uh, trials? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't know if it's going to go that way first. I think it's going to, I think where the airline industry is now is all the assist that happens um, with the pilot in terms of, you know, planes have had autopilot for years. And what that means is you dial in basically the, the if you were, if, if the analogy would be if you were using Google Maps or Apple Maps or your favorite mapping software and you wanted to say, how am I going to get to where I am to the airport? Google Maps would give you the direction. Um, our planes have that, and then they plug in the turn by turn into the plane. And um, with a pilot still there, the aircraft will actually go. It won't land, but it'll get all the way there, um, you know, on its own. That kind of that kind of technology assist and getting all that smarter and smarter, and actually helping the plane land and helping the plane take off, and you know when there are conditions that aren't right, giving alerts to the pilots about what to do. That assist, I think, is what you're gonna see more and more of versus again, not having it anywhere. Yep, makes sense, makes sense. So you'd have this uh, assist, you'd have uh, at some point long, long-term autonomous vehicles. Let me ask you about adoption of technology. Mm -hmm. um, because I think in a certain way, air travel for people from the beginning to get on a plane is kind of, you know, you know, who are these pilots that are flying? I even feel like an occasion when it's bad weather and I, I give myself all the analytic arguments, planes don't crash in the air, they don't crash much landing or takeoff, but you still feel a little crazed. <laughs> as you think about technology adoption and we get into autonomous vehicles, eventually autonomous aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. Any learnings from air travel about how we get consumers to get comfortable with adoption of technology? Uh, you know, um, that's a good question. I, you know, I think that um, 
technology adoption, you know, comes um, in small increments. And then all of a sudden you look back and you see um, big increments, right? So if you think about uh, the technology, the propulsion technology, how far and how fast aircraft are going now versus what they did, you know, the Kitty Hawk was, uh, is a, was a lot different. So it was, it was all pretty incremental in terms, of, in terms of how that happened. When you look back, it's kind of an amazing jump. I think it's going to be um, incremental like that. But I do think that the, the innovation now around technology um, and airlines is really about the customer experience. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we um, create a, an experience, even though you're flying, you know, 700 miles an hour, five miles in the air, you still want to stream video, yeah. right? And so uh, people are so, you know, when you, when you think about that statement, it's like, I can't believe it works at all. Yet people want it to work the same way it works in your living room. Um, and so, you know, innovating on that and driving that kind of innovation, I think, is a good example of how expectations move mm -hmm. and, you, and, and, and everything is blurring. When yeah. we think about our mobile app, you know, we could think about it as, well, we're a 90-year-old company and we have a lot of technology that's decades old. So you can't expect that to work as well as the, as the technology from a, from a company that's owned in around five or 10 years and has no technical debt. Mm -hmm. Because customers don't think that. They're like, oh, I don't have to have as a high an expectation. This is an old company. You have the same expectation as you do. And so I think that's what's rising all of the expectations of consumers and how things are happening is the most innovative companies and the most innovative experiences are being adopted back um, to, you know, to all of the, I'll call traditional industries. Yeah. Let me ask you on that topic. You know, you know, I think when we were doing the prep session, you said, you know, people don't think of United as a technology company. But when you look at our conversation the last 30 minutes, it's all technology and yeah. it's fairly fundamental in the airline with employees, with customers, all of that. Tell us, you know, how do you how have you kind of led digital transformations inside the company? And how do you think even for some of the people or are, are students on this? You know, thinking about working for what might be a traditional uh, company, but you're in a heavily technology oriented role. Yeah, uh, you know, you and I did have this uh, conversation because folks think that if you're in technology, you want to work for a technology company. Uh, but just like uh, the speaker right before me, you know, uh, a printer company is a pretty high tech company right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so are airlines. And, you know, after aircraft, the next thing we spend the most money on at United Airlines is technology. It is our number two spend. And um, because it is literally everywhere. And yes, some of it is a little stodgier and maybe a little more boring than others, like financial ledgers and payroll systems and all that kind of stuff. But um, a lot of it is also very innovative, highly, um, you know, you know, high concept logistics. We are a big logistical puzzle. Uh, and so we need people with industrial engineering backgrounds and statistical backgrounds and uh, predictive analytics backgrounds that are going to actually help us make the airline uh, more reliable, more efficient, um, and a better experience for our customers. And so we literally do that in every single part of our business. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, technology is embedded. Excellent. Excellent. And in terms of other kind of tricks of the trade, transitioning your workforce in mm -hmm. technology, any learnings there that you'd put forward? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I, we also steal a lot of other ideas from, I'll say, newer, uh, smaller, and maybe not smaller anymore, but innovative companies. And that is when you're in a big company, a lot of times um, there can be big bureaucracy. and Bureaucracy to me, to me means slow. And we have done a lot of things to think about how can we move fast and the way we're thinking, how can we be agile? And the way we do that is really break down all of our projects and our thinking into the smallest pieces we can, and then we try it. And so, you know, an, another uh, piece of technology that we've, uh, we've had out for about a year and a half now is something we call Connection Saver. And this brings all of our data and all of our logistics together. And that is somebody who's connecting through one of our hubs to go to what, you know, they've got two flights. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how do we make sure, what do you do? We, we've all had this situation where our, our plane lands late 
and we sprint across the airport. We get to the gate of our next flight only to see the door closed and the plane still there. And that is awful. Especially if you go back to the United app and you go look and you see the plane actually landed on time or maybe even a little bit early. Yeah. A transparency can get us double double edged sword sometimes. Yeah. Connection Saver takes all of the real time data, not the flight schedule, but what is actually happening today about that flight. It takes into account how far that person has to go um, um, through the airport, whether they have bags. Um, and we actually make a re recommendation to the gate agent that says, you can hold this plane up to 11 minutes for Terry Kramer to get there. Mm -hmm. And that'll, and then by the way, we send you a text that says, we're holding the plane. Do not stop at Starbucks on the way, come directly to the flight. Um, we are, we are going to, uh, we are going to hold for you for a period of time and get on. And then I'll, by the way, also send a message to everybody who's on the plane saying, why are we waiting? Mm -hmm. uh, so they know we're waiting um, for three passengers that are connecting in from LA and um, good news. We're only going to land three minutes late, but we're still going to land on time. And that brings all of that logistics and customer service part together. Now that project took us three times to get right. Um, we had, we struggled and we just, we tried it in Denver first. Denver is a place where we have a lot of customers that connect um, and we tried it and it just, we weren't getting the calculations right. Um, our gate agents uh, didn't believe the information we were showing them. They want transparency too. Why are we holding this flight? And so we iterated this multiple times until we got it right at Denver. And then we moved it to our other hubs and rolled it out. And now, you know, we save a couple hundred uh, to a thousand flights a day, customers a day flights by holding on the connection, which is a win-win for everybody. We want you on that plane. We'd have to rebook you and we don't want to do that either. Absolutely. But we iterate, we iterate yeah. and we try and we really um, think about it's okay, not on a safety side of things, but generally it's okay to have a project not go right. So try it, see if it works, iterate. Try it again. Um, we do this on our website and our mobile app all the time. We call it, and we also call it A-B testing. Yeah. We say, you know, what do we think is going to work? And we sometimes, we, sometimes we take bets or, you know, vote on what to, which version we think customers going to like better. And I'll tell you, I never get it right. But we, we'll, we'll, lend, we'll send 10% of the um, customer volume one way, 10% another way, and the other 80% stay um, like nothing ever happened. And we'll watch and see what the results look like. And once we see that, then we go ahead and roll it and implement it all the way across. Yeah, this all, by the way, sounds very much like a, a traditional tech company. The idea yeah, of Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. very, very similar. Let me ask you two last questions. We got a lot of questions from students, but let me ask you a couple last questions on COVID and new normals. So as yeah. you look at air travel, um, tell us, you know, where do you think that's going? You know, what is the new normal for transportation, for air travel? How will it look different? Yeah, I don't think we completely know. Um, I will say that, you know, I felt like this was going to be like a couple of weeks, you're going to be home and they were going to go back and everything was going to be the same. That's clearly you know, it's not going on here. Uh, but I think um, um, what we're finding is employees have a lot more flexibility uh, and, are, and we've proven that we can, we need to, can work from home. Mm -hmm. And so what we think about, what is the reason that employees come together to get things done? And there, you know, we have a kind of a mantra of things that we think about that are really important for us to do face-to-face. -face. And what are the things that's okay um, for us to either be remoting in through a video Zoom like this, or whether you can do your own, your own work. Um, we're hearing more and more about people that are living in other places. And so I think what's gonna happen um, from a business travel perspective is um, there were times when I would have to take an international trip in a day. I'd go out to London, I would have a meeting and then I would turn around and come back and I'd be exhausted. You know, I'd go for a week to India, but I'd only sleep in a hotel bed for two of those nights because of all the time zone changes and how long the flights are. Um, some of those are gonna go away. Um, but I think they're going to be replaced with people from wherever they are coming in, maybe not to headquarters, maybe to another city, coming in to have those crucial in-person events, meetings, sessions, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. um, 
I also think uh, that the other thing is that's happening is uh, they're, 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 they've got a word for it now. It's called leisure, which is business and leisure that are combined, where um, uh, you can think about people that are combining business trip with a leisure trip. They have to be, they have to be in LA for one day and they stay for four and work remote the other three. Um, and so there's like a different dynamic that's happening with this blending of leisure and business that is starting to emerge. So we'll see what that looks like. But, you know, I think people are social. Um, this, this is great um, being able to have this session. In some ways, you could say it was more efficient for me because I didn't have to get on a plane to come there. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, experiences are richer when they are together. I'd probably be better if there was a if there was an audience in front of me and I could see what was resonating and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's a reason that people get together. And so that's, that's going to come back in some way. Um, yeah. It'll just be different. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Your model is somewhat similar to how companies like Salesforce are thinking about their office layout where, you know, the new model is we need more space for bringing lots of people together at certain occasions and maybe less space for just in-office individual activity. It sounds yeah. analogous. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you a last question, then we'll go to student uh, questions here. Your leadership learnings navigating through COVID-19, when you talked about 450,000 people, I think, fly a day to less people flying than the number of pilots you had. Massive, massive shift. What were your broad learnings about leading in, in an environment that's changing so rapidly? Yeah. Um, you know, I think just like customers like transparency about what's going on with their flight, uh, everybody wants transparency about what's going on, especially in a crisis. And so, um, you know, I found that really frequent um, uh, communication was important and to be accessible. So we have um, every day at eight o'clock in the morning, we start our day off with a very brief 15 minute kind of operational overview of the day. It's a very short term focused meeting about, for example, what's going on right now is weather on the East Coast and what does that mean? And should we, we were going to do a big network change that night. Let's not do it when we're there or, you know, status of certain projects that are going in uh, to production and how that's going. Um, and so everybody knows that phone number or that team's call now and they get on it. So during the pandemic, I actually got on that every single day. Um, and some days I had a lot to say about what was happening. Um, some days I didn't have much, but people had a lot of questions. Uh, but just being accessible was super important. And so I, that's not sustainable really uh, for me, but uh, what we did change it to is I still go every single Tuesday. And so everybody knows that I'm there on a Tuesday. I'll be there otherwise if needed, but on Tuesday, I'm always there. So you've got a question, you can come in, um, you know, and ask that question. And so just being really transparent. Um, I think I always believed that um, the sum of the parts was bigger than the whole. And, and just because you're at the top of the org chart doesn't make you any smarter. Um, it was really forced in the pandemic to actually be really decentralized and democratized because what we did was um, let people try things and make decisions. And I was finding out things that were like done before I knew they were worked on. Uh, and you have to be comfortable with that. Um, but I'll tell you, way more things went right than not. And I didn't, I wasn't in, in the way to slow anything down. So really letting teams have autonomy, um, allowing them to make mistakes as long as they admit that they're there, you know, it's okay to do that. Just don't keep plowing away. If it's a bad idea, stop. That's the worst thing you do is like, just keep going. Excellent. Yeah, very good to learn anything for all of us. Let me take a bunch of questions. Number okay. one. Voted question. Um, how is 5G rollout affecting United Airlines operations and the airline industry in general? What are your plans to cope with this new reality? And I think there was news on CNBC just before I came on, but I don't know the news. But what's your view on 5G? Yeah. And, you know, uh, as you know, Terry, I worked for a Canadian telecom company before I came to United. So I'm kind of in the crosshairs on this. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things, and I implied this along the way, but the airline industry, especially the U.S. airline industry, has to be first and foremost safe. And we have a very, very low tolerance for anything that isn't safe. And our regulator, which is the FAA, um, you know, oversees to make sure that happens. 
Um, so when the FCC released a new set of spectrum to run 5G, it's called the C-band, um, to run 5G, this spectrum, it runs pretty close to the same spectrum that our altimeters use. And so when I talk about pilot assist and all those things, mm -hmm. um, radar altimeters um, run on a frequency which actually bounce off the ground and give a very accurate how far off the ground is the airplane versus a GPS kind of almost close approximate thing. Um, pretty important when you're in low visibility flying and in the, in in the pilots are in the cloud, they're relying on that instrument. So what happened over the last few weeks was really a little bit of a difference in standards over what was acceptable safety between what the FAA thought was safe and what the FCC felt was okay. Kind of a little bit of an interagency squabble that the airlines and the telcos were kind of stuck in the middle of. So what happened was the airline CEOs and the telco CEOs got together and figured out what to do about this, which was, how do we let 5G roll out? That's a really game-changing technology for all of us, including us. We want to use it in our airports. Mm -hmm. um, but also, how do we make sure that planes can still fly safely? And so they came up with basically a way that says, we're there. they turned up 5G everywhere but, but two miles around airports. And two miles around airports, there's a series of things which are either lowering the power of the 5G towers or pointing them away from where the airplanes would be. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is how we're gonna coexist safely. There was a little bit of stir up because um, for example, the 777 um, Boeing 777 aircraft have an altimeter that seemed to have um, probably a lower tolerance. So they, they were getting interference a little bit more. And so there's little stricter rules about 777s and a few other aircraft. But we've now, I think, worked it through and, you know, this is going to be um, behind us quickly. And so for an average passenger that's at LAX or O'Hare, are they going to have a, a slightly different 5G experience likely in airport or no, they'll, they'll still have basically what they would have had downtown or anywhere else? I think in the short term, the answer is probably yes. Um, in the short term, I think in the medium term, they're gonna figure out how to, again, really concentrate the directional signal of 5G. Where we're standing in the middle of a terminal is not where a radar altimeter needs to operate. So if they can always be pointing it in towards where the people are versus up where the airplanes are, yep. um, I think they're gonna figure it out. But in the short term, they're gonna be conservative and it probably will be a little bit different. I listened to an interview, the CEO of Emirates, blasted the all of the U.S. I mean, I, yeah. I, I thought, wow, I, it's kind of bad form depending on what he wants from the U.S. and gate space and all that. But he just said the U.S. has not performed well here because the rest of the world kind of had this figured out. But I don't know if it's due to unique spectrum awards here or, or what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me take the next question here. There's a variety of other questions about the environment and about sustainability. Okay. Um, and you, you were touching on this earlier. United recently announced their investment in hydrogen startup Zero Avia. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see hydrogen and electric technologies transforming United's operations? Yeah, it's a long game. You know, like we said before, I don't think this is something that's going to change us, um, you know, let's say in the next five or maybe even the next 10 years in a material way. Um, but we are getting behind this to help with the research and the op so that we can move it and that it, it does become more of a reality. But it's, it's a longer term thing. Excellent. Excellent. Very helpful. Another question on digital transformation. Um, what are the characteristics you look at to help execute technological changes? How do you predict or measure their, um, these technological changes, whether they're going to be successful? I assume, in essence, you know, in any one day, there's a thousand things you could do in terms of technology initiatives. What is your mental map yeah. that says, we're going to go do this one and not this one? Yeah. First and foremost, we're aligned with what the airline's goals and objectives are. Mm -hmm. So as I had said, we really are focused on having United be the airline that customers choose. Uh, in other words, translated into what is our NPS? Um, and we really need to get ourselves back to profitability. 
Um, and you can't just raise your prices, you know, for one thing in the airline industry, everybody matches. So you really can't do that. Yeah. Um, you have to become more efficient. And so those are the top two things that we're working on. And that's kind of a short term, but longer term, we're also growing as an airline. We bought 270 new airplanes. Uh, we put orders in for 270 new airplanes and we will in 2023, or maybe 2024, we'll get a new airplane every three days, mm -hmm. which is a lot. And so um, building up to that scale, I've got to look back at the technology platforms and say, are we able to handle that increased uh, scale? And so we've got some things we're doing now, primarily about getting things uh, more into the cloud um, to get a more variableized view so that when we get to that point where we're a much bigger airline, um, we've got the capacity uh, to be able to do that. It's not as simple as hardware and software. It's, you know, the throughput of the different mechanisms and uh, services that we run, making sure that they're going to scale. Excellent. Another question looking forward on technological leaps in air travel. Do you see as an example, supersonic travel becoming viable in the next five to 10 years? So another uh, company that we invest in is Boom Supersonic, mm -hmm. um, which is going to have a supersonic aircraft. Now these, if you, if if you're old enough to remember the Concorde, these weren't very big planes. They're more like a regional jet um, in terms of the number of people that'll sit on it. This will be about the same. Um, they um, are working on that. We have pilots and engineers that are, are, are helping them with that process. I think it's, um, they're, they're saying that we should have a plane ready in 2029, which is seven years from now, call it maybe eight, if it's the end of 2029. I think that's aggressive, mm -hmm. but um, hopefully that's what will happen. Excellent. Similar question on electric aircraft, fully electric aircraft. Your view on that? Same. Uh, so that really is about battery power and thrust and how we can get the weight of the batteries, because you're going to need a lot um, to actually um, be able to do that. So battery power will probably first be seen in I'll call it hyper regional flight. And we're thinking about like short hops into busy metropolitan airports. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of driving to LAX or driving into Newark or into O'Hare, um, there might be short hops coming in from the downtown area that would carry seven or eight passengers. That, that'll probably be the first place that you'll see battery powered. The company that we invested in there is called Archer. Interesting. This is similar to the vertical takeoff landing. Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's all together, right? Yep. Yep, good, very, very helpful. Um, another uh, question here, if, uh, United spends a lot on technology. What is the limitation in providing free basic Wi-Fi service to all uh, uh, customers given how ubiquitous connectivity is? Two things, candidly cost is a factor and when something's free, you'll use more of it. Um, it is, we do pay, it is expensive because it's satellite based. Um, that's one piece. The other piece, um, which we will work our way through that somehow, but the other piece is once it's free and everybody's using it, is there going to be enough bandwidth? And it's not just the bandwidth on the airplane, but again, if all the planes flying around a given satellite are all free Wi-Fi, will the satellite have enough? So we need more, we're going to need more satellites for that to happen. And there's lots of companies um, working on that, um, but those are probably the two big, the two big things. If it's going to be free, we have to have a good experience. Yep. Excellent. Um, next question. Um, with the phasing out of jumbo jets, do you see United moving towards more nimble, personalized, on-demand travel? And maybe you could expand it to even the data role of all of this, like the ability to forecast where you need to fly, when, for who, and then how will that uh, uh, change service provision? Yeah. One of the most sophisticated systems that we have is the one that actually designs our network. We call it our network, our, our airplane network about where we fly and what planes fly where. And so, again, another big logistical problem because we only have only have so many gates at Newark. We even have less gates in Long Beach or, or other airports that aren't our big places. So they all can't arrive at the same time. So you have to have this ballet of planes coming in and out. Um, you want to maximize utilization of those planes. You want them to be up in the air as much as possible with enough buffer. If something goes wrong, you can actually work it through. So that whole orchestration of the network is one of our most sophisticated systems. Fascinating. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I heard Scott Kirby speak recently and he was mentioning at LAX still waiting on Terminal 8 or something. And because of the gate restrictions at LAX, they actually need more big aircraft there. And that right. includes the desire, the desire to go to, to smaller. Yeah, that's right. We, that's called upgaging. And if you only can fly one flight a day, a day whatever city it is, you want to fly the biggest plane that you have customers that can fill. There's a way to yep. think about it. Makes, makes sense. Um, let's see here. For the business community, how do you plan to leverage technology and people to make people more comfortable to fly without the fear of COVID? You know, we um, commissioned a study with DARPA um, really very early. I think it was probably the summer of 2020 that the, that the study was actually published um, that actually showed that um, air travel is actually one of the safest places you can be indoors. And that is because of the way the airflow is designed. Believe it or not, this design comes from the days of tuberculosis. Uh, and other, uh, that was the airborne virus they were worried about. But the way the airflow works through an air cabin, um, that, you know, the people on either side of you, of course, are always going to be an issue. But it's not, it's not the whole airplane because of the way the filtration works, the HEPA filtration. Um, masks add an additional level of protection. But um, probably the things we have to think about is all the places you are before you get on the airplane and the airports and all those different places in terms of, of how that works. Um, but, you know, what I would say um, is customers are coming back. I mean, we see, leisure travel is back to where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, business travel isn't there because there's nowhere to go. You talk to the consulting companies that are willing to fly, but if they, you know, they go to my office right now, I'm not there. So, um, you know, they aren't, um, they aren't traveling yet. And so when that starts to happen, we'll, we'll, we'll see it come back. But, but we aren't seeing um, a broad-based head and sleeve fly right now. Excellent. Excellent. Linda, let me do this now. Let me do what I like to do at the end of all these and do my so what's, my takeaways, and I'm going to let you upgrade them. And then if you have any parting comments, advice to the UCLA community as they think about uh, things. So I want to start out just with your philosophical, interesting philosophical view about the use of technology. And you described it as the intersection of kind of customer NPS and efficiency, that if you're thinking about technology well and where it gets deployed, it's gonna help you reduce costs, but it's also gonna boost satisfaction. And that's a, a good place to play with technology where you don't get into kind of a, a bad outcome. And the mobile app was, uh, was a, a good example of, uh, of that. Second main takeaway is about the power of data and how that data is not just allowing you to look kind of historically, but it is allowing you to predict future activities. And you talked about it in relation to passengers and their attitude towards the airline based on a bunch of experiences that can guide uh, behavior. You talked about it operationally, but basically the power of data in a predictive way is the same things we would talk about with diagnostic tools in healthcare or recommendation engines and digital streaming, et cetera. There is very much an analogous uh, uh, case in, uh, in the airline industry. A third major point is a lot of how you're thinking about technology and technology deployment is on what you call technology assist. So as opposed to kind of wholly ripping out people and putting in the technology, you're putting the technology in the hands of your employees and allowing them to kind of use that to make better decisions on interfaces with customers and, uh, and others. Um, another kind of two or three points all have to do with your leadership philosophy. And as we're living in times where things are changing a lot and we've got to be prioritized and all that, um, agility is very, very important. And one of the ways that you described enhancing agility is break things down to their smallest element which is not actually in technology the natural way. Sometimes we look at the big thing and you, you called me nicely out on it with autonomous aircraft and autonomous vehicles is, you know, before you get to, you know, the final stage of the whole thing, think about the incremental gains that you can get and how that advances you on, uh, on a, a journey. A couple last uh, points that you uh, made, 
on new normals, um, this ability to think about a different mix of how, where, when, and why people travel. Just like Salesforce is thinking about their office space and do they need you know, all the kind of cubicles versus bigger, you're going through the same thing to think about what that configuration of air travel is. And that is enabled by data. Uh, you have all sorts of data, but it's also gonna have some human judgment with it. And then the final uh, piece is just about leadership in a crisis. And your point about the criticality of transparency and communicate more often, more regularly, and whether that's with your uh, passengers about what's going on with flights or wh whether it's with your employees, that ability to, to be transparent and agile with information will buy you credibility and agility of that workforce and trust at a time you need them to be comfortable in, in the gray matter uh, yeah. in environments like COVID. Those yeah. are the takeaways I got. Do you have upgrades on those or parting comments? No, I think that was uh, that was an excellent summary. You can tell uh, you can tell what you do for a living. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, you know what I would say is something that we said in passing. You know, I know um, many folks here are students, and from a student perspective, and you're thinking about what do you do when you get your degree. You know, we you, to to have a career in technology. You can certainly um, have a rewarding career in the technology industry for sure. Um, but don't forget all the other industries that are out there and the fact that, that they all and we all need strong technical analytical brains and technical professionals. And so, you know, I would encourage people if you have a passion for something, you know, they, they, they call a aviation, they call them ab geeks. And, you know, if you love aviation, or if you like retail, or if you, you know, that all, every, any industry you can think of, manufacturing, um, uh, you know, any of those things all have strong needs and desires for really top technical talent. And so don't, you know, take a look at those because it's really important um, that you like what you do and that the company, you align with the mission of, of the company that you have. And, that always helps if you have a hidden passion somewhere for it. So I encourage people to do that. You know, uh, uh, Linda, there's a professor at Harvard Business School, Linda Hill, who's one of the organizational behavior professors. And she just uh, 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 shared kind of the latest work on their broader digital effort at Harvard Business School. And you couldn't have demonstrated more what she's talking about. She says, we shouldn't use the term, this is a digital leader and this is not a digital leader. She right. said, everybody is a, a digital leader or has to be a digital leader. And it's what you do to build the culture in the organization that responds to issues and uses data and a whole bunch of other things. And I have to say from this session, you've done such a great job to typify that every company is a technology company. Your examples that you brought up were today and very future oriented, not kind of 10 years ago stuff. And I really applaud you uh, on that. So a big, big thank you for a lot of good learnings about leadership, about technology, uh, uh, et cetera. Well, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me, Terry. You really bet. Did. You bet. And then let me just do a quick wrap up for the, the broader audience on our session today, which I just thought, you know, all three sessions were just outstanding. Let me just uh, uh, do a few reminders here and kind of observations from what I saw. You know, number one, it's interesting when we talk about new normals, new business models, et cetera, the number of cases where technology is being described as an enabler for what are a lot of new normals in healthcare, in transportation, in education, in work, et cetera, is amazing. And I always look at how are people referring to technology? Are they saying it kind of, well, it's not really here and here are all the problems with it. We didn't hear much of that. We heard much more, we've got high-speed networks, we've got data, this is what the data is doing for us, this is how we create collaboration tools. It's all very much in the here and now, and so I would submit the maturity of the technology and the ability to transition to these new normals is quite significant. I also would say that many of the changes that have been described over the past two years with the pandemic are becoming new normals. Very little reference today about people saying, well, when we get through with the pandemic, we're going to go back to do X, Y, and Z. 
Instead, people are talking about telehealth and digital streaming and predictive capabilities and remote working, et cetera, in a very kind of normal way. I also want to kind of talk very briefly about this idea that people are buying products, what Keith referenced, and the fact that that changes supply chain and thinking about what are all the enablers that allow a big change to occur. So the level of vertical integration, do you have transportation, et cetera, is very important. The role of climate in technology, how important that is. It's interesting, all three speakers talked about climate in their own form. Gail talking about with data that empowers better understanding of climate. Keith talking about reusing materials. Linda talking about new energy modes and new fuel sources, all of it related to climate. And then the final piece, maybe the most important, just leadership lessons all around about the need to stay agile, about the need to, to really think about things in a positive way, where some of the gains gonna exist going forward and how important it is to be flexible. Let me just say a couple of thank yous here in final closing. I just wanna thank, first of all, all of the planners of this Innovate Conference. We have a great team from Andertech that have helped us put on this event. We have a great group from the Easton Center, uh, Heather, Jamie, Darina, that make conferences look easy and they're not. Thank you very much uh, there. And just a huge thank you to all of you for engaging here, that making this a vibrant conversation. Please stay well. I hope you found today helpful and look forward to seeing you uh, very, very soon. Thank you. Take care.